My prayer for us during this, these few days together is that we have a new touch of the Holy Spirit in our ministry. And that somehow this conference may serve as a catalyst to bring us together as people involved in our tenor evangelism. And my text is one that you have used and you would expect me to use tonight in Ephesians, the fourth chapter and the 11th and 12th and 13th verses. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Some evangelist. The evangelist is a gift of God to the church. And many times, many of our denominations have forgotten that and they've neglected evangelism and they've neglected the evangelist and they've neglected his gift and there are many people in our denominations that are gifted evangelists, but they're not supported by the church. And they should be, because if they don't, the church is going to die. No, it's not going to die because the gates of hell can't prevail against it. And many of you pay a great price for being an evangelist. Some have come here weary and burned out close to tears. Some of you are showing signs of suffering for Christ's sake. Many have tensions. There are tensions in your church, tensions in the home and the family. And I'm so glad the spouses can be here. And many of you are near physical and emotional exhaustion. Many have come from thrilling evangelistic efforts, which you could tell about and share tonight that would bless us all. But others have come from spiritual deserts where very little is happening and you've seen very few results. So many of you have come where there's been very little. But with different backgrounds, we've come to share this week our victories, our problems, our defeats, and our joys. And Christ has given us a variety of gifts to use in the church. Apostles prophets, evangelists, pastors, professors. We're not engaged in a contest of greatness, but rather a cooperative enterprise of fitting all believers into a perfectly functioning, mature men and women, capable of resisting error and standing up for the truth by word and deed. We're here tonight because all of us are engaged in some form of evangelistic activity. We're here also because of the urgency of the hour. The world situation at times seems to be almost as dangerous as the days just before World War I or World War II. There is an urgency of the hour. There's an urgency in this country. In the midst of all this, you and I must prepare the ground sow the seed of God's word and water it. Paul declared to the Corinthians, I planted and Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Strangely, all that we see happening is a marvelous preparation for the gospel. There's never been a moment when there's been such worldwide preparation for the proclamation of the gospel as we see at the moment. People are disillusioned. Secular answers have failed them. We've tried everything in our search for peace and security and fulfillment, and we haven't found it. Materialism, politics, drugs and alcohol, sex and money, the occult, Satan worship, false philosophies and religions have failed. Thus millions are open to the message of the hope of new life in Christ. It seems that Jesus spoke of a time like this when he said, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the, in the stars and upon the earth the stress of nations 
with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Seldom has the soil of the human heart and mind been better prepared than it is today. The words of Jesus challenged me as never before. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already under harvest. They are ready and waiting. But I've learned one thing, harvest time is short. This is harvest time in America and in Canada and Mexico and throughout North and South America. It's harvest time. I've never seen so many people come to Christ in so short a time as we're seeing today. An evangelist is a person with a special gift and a special calling from the Holy Spirit to announce the good news of the gospel. It's a gift of God. You cannot manufacture it. It cannot be organized or manipulated. It's a calling from God. First, I want to say a word about the message of an evangelist because you're going to study it in detail in your workshops and you're going to hear messages on that subject. When Paul left the city of Corinth, what did he say? For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was his message. He could have used his intellectual ability. He could have talked on other subjects, but he didn't. He said, I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus and him crucified. I remember I was in Australia and we were holding a crusade in the great stadium and I turned to the Archbishop Marcus Lone, one of the greatest men of God it's ever been my privilege to know. He was the primate of Australia, of the Church of England, the Anglican Church. I said, Marcus, what should I preach on tonight? This was the opening night and he was the chairman. He said, preach on John 3.16 and preach on it every night you're here for three weeks. He said, that's the message that God needs, needs to be heard in Australia. One of the most important truths I've learned as an evangelist preaching in over 80 countries is that the gospel cuts across every cultural, political, and social barrier. Never change the message. We try to preach it in the context of the group to whom we're talking. The gospel never changes. The human heart doesn't change. The human heart is filled with sin. We've broken God's commandments. We're estranged from God. We're separated from God. We need reconciliation. And the only reconciliation is the cross and the resurrection and repentance and faith. And whatever place I'm in, I know that that gospel is going to work because God made it for the whole human race. Then there are the various methods that we use in communicating the gospel. What are they? Well, there are many methods. I don't say that so-called mass evangelism that we use is the proper method for everybody. There's a thousand different methods. It's like the wheels of a bicycle, many spokes going toward the center. But when we proclaim the gospel, we are to do it with authority. And the authority is based upon the word of God. I have no trouble about the scriptures being inspired because many years ago I settled it by faith and I don't care what the scholars say. I, I know that, that that book is inspired of God. I was out in the bright moonlight in the Sierras in California in early 1949 in a conference. And I went out into the moonlight and put my Bible on a stump and opened it and I said, oh God, I've been listening to these seminary people and they've got me somewhat confused about this being your divine inspired word of God. I said, I don't know everything about it. I don't understand it all. But I accept this book by faith as your word. And I've never had a problem since then.
and, and, and that is your authority. You have the authority of the words of Christ. You have the authority of scriptures. You have the authority of your own walk with the Lord. You have the authority given to you by God, the Holy Spirit. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. We should be like Jeremiah. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in, the, in my bones. Is the word of God like a burning fire in your soul and mine? I have to ask myself that question. It's not always there. And I get concerned about it sometimes. And I have to fall on my face before God and I say, Oh God, I want to be like Jeremiah. I want this word to burn in my heart. And then proclaim it with simplicity. We need to avoid the temptation to impress people with our learning or our travels or our intellectual abilities or our cleverness or our eloquence. The Bible says the common people heard him gladly. Why? Because they understood him. He spoke their language. And last, we are to communicate the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit. If we try to manipulate or manufacture success, or we try to take credit for what God is doing, then we will be set aside by God. I am the Lord, and my glory I will not share with another, says the Lord. But preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit also means living in the power of the Holy Spirit. We must be men and women who are pure vessels for God's message. But I think in closing, this is a very wonderful day to be alive. It's a day which God has allowed us to live. I'm glad that he allowed me to live to see a new dawning for evangelism. Evil is very strong, but God is stronger. Man is on a self-destruction binge, but God is still in the business of turning men and women's lives around and bringing them to himself. Hold your head high. You're a child of the King. I'm looking forward to that day when we will all stand and sing, all hail the power of Jesus' name. What a day that's going to be. And you and I will be there because of Christ.